Welcome uh, to my session. My name's Helen Carter. I'm assistant head teacher uh, at Burnage Academy for Boys in South Manchester. And one of my roles is professional mentor for both uh, ITT and Teach First. And I also am professional mentor for NQTs. Uh, you'll have to bear with me at some points in the presentation today, as I was told I was going to be talking to ten people. So, uh, hello. I was told it was you lot at half ten as I was in the car. So, um, you know, I hope for the best. Right. Um, good to outstanding. Now, I want to preface everything I'm going to say today by the fact that we can't all be outstanding. I know that I'm going to talk about good to outstanding procedures and that the universities, both Manchester and Manmet that I work with, do like trainees to work towards outstanding, but it is, it's just not feasible for everybody to be outstanding and I really do believe that. And this academic year I've worked with eight trainees, one of whom will use the good to outstanding procedures to get there and one of whom I just wouldn't go there because she was just good. And I think in order to move the good to outstanding procedures into place, the person has to have the potential. We can't just pass everybody off as outstanding because they hit one or two elements of the criteria. Um, so what I'd like us to do is just think, what is the difference between good and outstanding? Uh, now in a group of 10, that would have been quite a small discussion, so could I just ask you to speak to the per people around you, just for a minute, what do you think the difference is between good and outstanding, please? A minute. So, could I ask for some of you to share your thoughts? What, what do you think the difference is between good and outstanding, without looking at the progress indicators that I gave you? <laughs> yes? Um, I just think one thing that you see in an outstanding um, trainee is they bring their own ideas. Yeah. Uh, they like, they still want the support, they still seek your support, they still respect support, but they bring a lot of ideas, and I know that I get some ideas off of outstanding yeah. trainees. And I think something very important to add to that is the idea of being receptive yes. to, to the support, not, the, not this idea of I know everything. Okay, thank you. Some people from the back, anybody want to share? Be consistent. Uh, so Consistency is the key. I mean, yeah, I know what you mean about the one-off cartwheels through the classroom type lesson. However, they're not going to hit outstanding in every single lesson because we're all human beings. And if, you know, when you're teaching... In, when you're in your NQT year teaching five periods a day, it's not going to happen. So as a trainee, to, for someone who's outstanding, I would expect to see that level for the majority of the time. But we're all going to have a bad lesson at any point. Has anybody got anything to add? The Apart from a phone. The, the risk takers. <laughs> yeah, the risk taking. They're, like, they're thinking outside the box. They're prepared to have a go. The creativity, you can't teach that. That has to come from within. Yeah, you can't teach that. Um, I've given you um, an A4 sheet. Does anybody not have one? It's got the standards down one side and the, then there's some space. Good to outstanding. Could you take some up to the back for me? Thank you. Without using the progress indicators, I just want you to think about the eight teaching standards and just between yourselves, write down what you think is the characteristic of a good trainee against that standard and then of an outstanding trainee against that standard. Bullet point is fine, not lots of detail, I just want us to engage with the process. And it's not a test, so you can talk. <laughs> if we go through it, we can add, you can add to it as we go along, but the reason I was asking you to do it without looking at the progress indicators was I just want us to see what we naturally think and then look at the, well, the judgement that we actually have to apply in the classroom. So for standard one, set high expectations which inspire, motivate and challenge pupils. Has anybody got an example for good that they'd like to share? To be engaging, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah? Kids. In whatever way engaging looks like, because in across all of our disciplines it's going to look very different. But what about outstanding then? That's inspirational. Inspirational, yeah. And like we've said, you can't necessarily teach that. We can observe it and then we can try it ourselves, but you can't say to somebody, go and this is how you are outstanding. A lot of it does come from within. And it is experiential learning, watching someone else, putting things into practice, generating your own ideas. It's also very subjective, isn't it? Set high expectations, because your expectations could be different from mine, from yours. And that's one of the problems I think a lot of us have with Ofsted, when we're, when we're being observed and they say, well, one child wasn't engaged, but they don't know if that child's always very you know like that but they are actually engaged they just might be looking out the window because they live in traumatic circumstances so number two standard two promote good progress and outcomes by pupils 
How about someone from the middle area? What would good look like? Good would look like somebody expressing the learning at the start of the lesson, um, and then perhaps checking at the end that the majority of the classroom have taken on. Yeah. So in their plenary, they might be doing a quick survey of how many people have met the learning objective. Sticker yeah, on sticker on the wall, hands up, all kinds of traffic lights, that kind of thing. What would outstanding look like? Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Constant mini plenaries all the time through questioning, through post-it notes, through whichever mechanism they're doing it. They're checking the progress all the time. Yeah. Responding to what's in front of them, absolutely. And then letting that feed into what's going to happen in the next lesson. Rather than sticking rigidly to their scheme of work that they've so diligently prepared, they have to respond to what's in front of them. Um, standard three, good subject and curriculum knowledge. I'm emphasising the word curriculum there because uh, we had a bit of a battle with one of our trainees this year in MFL who, because she was French, was demanding that she got an outstanding for subject knowledge but she wasn't understanding that that actually includes curriculum knowledge. It doesn't matter how well you speak that language. We've all got a degree relatively in the subject we're going to teach, which would class as excellent to outstanding, but it's the curriculum knowledge that's important as well. Um, what, what do we think good would look like then? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Speak it so using keywords, key phrases from the curriculum. Yeah. What about in outstanding? Yeah. I think that sometimes it's also the way that the learning builds upon each other, so that like in primary school, that if you started the right bit of Latin, you're actually building upon it instead of just taking something. So using it in different contexts, yeah, building on it. Yeah. You see a child that's got something, then having the subject knowledge to change the lesson to yeah. move on to the next thing. Yeah, absolutely. And also the breadth of understanding, so you know that you don't. Yeah. I call it with trainees when I'm training in school, I call it the meta language of learning. So what are the key words for your subject and how do they apply to other key words such as connectives from English to be using in your essays? How often are you referring to them? I mean, I am an English teacher, but how often is a trainee referring to words from the mark scheme in their daily language with the children? And that might be, and I really do insist on this, pupil-friendly mark scheme, so that the kids are engaging with what they need to do to get to the next level. Lots of these standards are linking in with each other, aren't they? They're not actually really discrete standards, because planning is teaching. Marking, assessment, that is planning. If you're not doing your marking, you can't be planning for the next stage. So a lot of these do link in together. And an outstanding trainee will have that holistic overview. They won't think, right, well, I'm going to get outstanding for S3. You're looking at how it all fits together into the jigsaw of learning how to be a teacher. Um, so plan and teach well-structured lessons. I'm not going to go through each one of these. I'm sure we're all in agreement that a good teacher will have planned, but the outstanding teacher will make adaptations as they're going along. Uh, adapting teaching to respond to the strengths and needs of all pupils. Well, personally, I think to be outstanding, you've got to react to what's in front of you. You know, you've planned a lesson. Uh, it's period five, straight after lunch. It's been wet break, and the kids come down the corridor in a mental state. Change what you're going to do. It doesn't matter what the lesson plan is in front of you. Have that confidence. Obviously, not the very first time you teach, but build up to being very flexible. Accurate and productive use of assessment self-explanatory really but I think to be outstanding you use that assessment with the kids and I've got some examples um, to go through with you can I ask how many of you are primary okay um, some of the resources I've got are based on secondary because I wasn't aware it was for both primary and secondary today so please bear with me um, manage behavior effectively to ensure a good and safe learning environment we're all going to have hiccups aren't we you know children are children we can't be responsible for their every single move but an outstanding teacher will not have that many behaviour problems from quite early on. Would we agree? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And why, why is that? So they reflect upon their practice so they progress yeah. and learn from that state. 
Yes, absolutely, and be very willing to take advice and be very human about it. Realise that we all have bad lessons. We will, children bring the baggage from outside and often take it out on us, and an outstanding trainee will realise that from quite early on. And wider professional responsibilities. I'd like to use this example by actually going to the progress indicators. If we could all turn to the very back page, because um, I will ask you to use the progress indicators during the session. I'd like us to look at standard 8D. Uh, Take responsibility for improving teaching through appropriate professional development, responding to advice and feedback from colleagues. And if we just go to the good column, it says take responsibility for their own learning and professional development. To be outstanding, proactive with their own learning and professional development. I, I really think that is something you can't teach. You can't teach someone, and as an adult, how to be proactive. You can give recommendations as to, that's the Senko's office, there's the head of VAL, but you cannot make people, um, you cannot make people be proactive. All you can do is provide a guide. Would we, would we agree? I was going to say you can model it. You can, absolutely, you can model it, but we can't, if we're dragging people to see the Senko to get information on our children, they're not going to be outstanding. Okay? Right, um, in terms of the processes, good to outstanding procedures, uh, these kick in at review four onwards. At primary, do the trainees have a review four? Okay, sorry, this is only relevant to secondary there, but the, the, the process of good to outstanding is the same. Um, so review four, there's a tight turnaround of about a month from review four to review five. From review four onwards, you can initiate good to outstanding procedures. I have got copies of this PowerPoint to give out afterwards if people need it. Um, use the progress indicators to set targets. Develop a support plan and how you are going to monitor it. Now, when I say set targets, I don't mean against every standard because that would be insurmountable. And a lot of these are interchangeable. My advice would be to focus on two to three standards that will enable the trainee to move towards outstanding. If the trainee is at good in every single area, there is no point in initiating good to outstanding because they're not going to move that far in a month. But if they have outstanding elements of their practice already, focus on what they need to do to improve to get the majority up to outstanding. You have an interim review, which is around two weeks in, and obviously that's not a large time scale, so we're working on very short-term success before you hit review five, where hopefully they will have done enough to become outstanding. Um, this is a copy of the form that you need for the initial one. As you can see, not much space, so we're talking a couple of standards. And then that's the, that's the review form. Okay, in practice, get the trainees to sit with the progress indicators and make the links between standards, as I've said. So what I'd like you to do now is just use the progress indicators and find a couple of um, the bullet-pointed strands from standards one to six. I don't want you to look at seven and eight, but if you just look at good to outstanding strands, one to six, see if there's any common ground between them. Any suggestions, any common themes that we've picked out straight away? S uh, recurring in each one? Yeah, if you... In quite a few. Thank you. I think knowing the pupils. Yeah, absolutely, knowing the pupils. Yeah, it is. Someone from this side? Anybody? Setting goals. Yep, yeah, setting goals, yeah, that are manageable. Yeah, more than one trick up your sleeve. Yeah, the things that we can't teach, like the creativity and the innovation, yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. Yeah. Take it taking the initiative, certainly. Um, can we just look at standard one, please? Standard one, uh, standard one B, set goals that stretch and challenge pupils of all backgrounds, abilities and dispositions. Um, if you haven't done any assessment on that class, they cannot, you cannot be doing that, can you? If you haven't planned, you cannot be setting the right goals. Okay, so it's about saying to the trainee, we might only be looking at one or two of the standards in, in close detail, but you are doing all of these. All right, you have to be looking at good to outstanding in every category, really. Um, S7 and S8, behaviour, if it's not there now, and I've put a space, if, a, if the trainee has got really poor behaviour management, are we looking at good to outstanding? 
No. And also professional responsibilities. If that's not there, that's, that's a problem. And I just don't think we should be looking at someone to move good to outstanding if either of those two things are missing. However, S1 to 6. Progress, engagement, progress, feedback, progress and creativity. Those are the things that I think are the most important. Progress appears a lot. I'm referring to the trainees' progress and also that of the students. If they can start evidencing really, really clear progress through a lot of the things we've already mentioned this morning, such as regular mini plenaries, lots of questioning, they will be moving towards outstanding. And as soon as students start to make progress, they become very engaged because they respond to positive praise, they respond to seeing their own success. And with creativity, if the kids are engaged, they're going to make progress. All right, so those are my four tips, really. Progress, engagement, feedback, and creativity. Progress being the most important one. And that translates into NQT year and beyond. If you are constantly evidencing excellent progress with the children, you're going to get outstanding. Um, so, one way to start doing this is in your lesson observations. As professional mentor or subject mentor, you are going to have to do more observations in a good to outstanding procedure. And the first thing I recommend is to do a question audit. What do you think I mean by question audit? Yeah? Yes, absolutely. Have your first lesson observation, or one of the first lesson observations during this process, as simply looking at their questions, nothing else. Write down what questions they ask. Are they open? Are they engaging? Are they directed? Are they open-ended? Audit their questions and then use a tutorial to go through with them how they could improve their own practice. How could they engage the students further? Video them if you can or just do a stopwatch. Teacher talk, student talk. We all know that it's in an ideal world it'll be 80% student talk, 20% teacher or moving towards more 50-50 but usually it's like 90-10 especially from a trainee. But if you, get, if you can video them and watch it back with them, it's a really useful tool. If you can't and you can just time them, use that in manageable chunks. Say to them, for 10 minutes of that lesson, you were talking about quadratic equations and the back row had fallen asleep. You know, they need to understand about their own engagement with the class. Language of learning. I mentioned this before, the meta-language. Are they using explicit language in their oral feedback are they just going oh very good well done or are they giving a well done that's great because you have used a connective are they giving very clear um, evidence in their oral feedback on how to make progress are they encouraging students to use it are they encouraging students to talk to each other using the language of their subject and i've put oral and written feedback I always say to trainees and other staff that I'm training that um, the most important form of feedback is oral because it's immediate, it's there. And it might be two weeks before you get round to marking their books. So we have a little, um, a little stamp that you can put in their book when you've given them oral feedback and date it so that Ofsted can then see you are engaging with them, etc. But it means something to the kids to know in the lesson how they are making progress. Um, this is a website that has got some excellent questioning techniques on to use with trainees. I do have a copy of the PowerPoint for you, so you don't need to copy it down, but it's a really good website, good to outstanding, and it's for all staff. It isn't just for trainees. Um, so feedback. How frequently are they using the meta-language of their subject? And have they used a pupil-friendly mark scheme to measure progress? Um, can I just have a show of hands? How many, of your, how many trainees that have been through your school have made their own mark schemes? A few. Yeah, good. It's something that I try to insist on from the beginning so that they are showing you how they can break down the subject knowledge in order for the students to access it. And can they make the biggest leap? And the biggest leap I say to them is using what Dylan Williams and Paul Black did in Inside the Black Box. Are they prepared to use comment-only marking without giving a grade? Because they often think we've got to give a grade to this piece of work. Because 30%... 30% of students will, be, will improve across all groups. Right, that's a really interesting statistic on feedback. If you just put a grade on, they won't make any improvement. If you give a grade and comments, they're not going to make much improvement either. But comment only, 
improvement. It's a really big, bold leap, but it does work. And then you have to give them time to engage with their feedback, engagement with the marking process. If they don't engage with the marking process in the next lesson, there's no point in giving the feedback. So it's about them, to be an outstanding trainee and then a future outstanding teacher, it's about embedding time in their lesson for students to go back, revisit what they've done and make those adjustments. Even if it's dictionary work, if it's literacy based, if it's spellings, there's no point you correcting things and putting SP if you're never going to give the kids time to go back and use it. Um, and then engagement with the marking obviously will evidence progress. That's something I, um, one of our trainees made last year. How your books are marked and then you'll have a T to give you your target, SA for self-assessment, P for peer assessment and VF for verbal feedback. Evidencing what the progress will look like, expected, good, outstanding, and then a list of how many assessments will be done during that. I can send it to you, Karen. I've got a photo. <laughs> it's midweek. <me> Pardon? <laughs> <laughs> Has anybody got any questions about that? I'm sure. I'm sure this is nothing new. I'm sure. I'm just uh, sharing ideas from our school with you. Okay, what I'd like to do now is, if with the people around you, you think of an example of a trainee that you've had who's been good and how you've maybe helped them to get to outstanding or not. Just have a little discussion amongst yourselves, if that's all right. Any examples you can think of? Thank you. Um, I just think we were missed actually is putting a trainee on good to outstanding in its so, Sorry, could you say that again? Actually putting the trainee on that good, good to, to outstanding, outstanding yeah. itself was the biggest thing I did for the trainee this year. Because yeah. she maybe didn't realise just how good she was. So in doing that, actually that action itself moved her on because it gave her the confidence Brilliant. To do it. Brilliant. Anyone else? Maybe at the back over this side? It's like my year 11 English class on a Friday <laughs> afternoon. Come on folks, it's not Shakespeare. Uh, anyone from the middle? <laughs> Yeah, that's important, observing other lessons outside. I mean, my dad retired from teaching just about two years into my own teaching career, and he said to me when I went from a PGC interview, you never, ever stop learning. You know, he'd been a deputy head for since I was born, and uh, he said, I am still learning even at this stage of my career, because no one class is the same. No one kid is the same. I, I've taught Romeo and Juliet 8,000 different ways. You have to, if you're a decent teacher, react to what is in front of you. Anybody from this side? Yeah. With, with training, you know, getting us to really think about how to give purposeful mm. feedback to students yeah. through through comments mm. um, and very you know, very targeted um, you know and I, I felt that that very much enhanced her Yeah. That links back to something you said earlier about modelling it for them. I mean, we could all say, right, go off and find out how to give effective feedback. That's not very helpful unless we're sitting down and showing them how to go through the mark scheme. Um, I've had an outstanding trainee in floods of tears after a lesson, and I think that's a brilliant example of why they are outstanding, because they, they care about it and they can reflect on it and go, thank you, and reflect on it and realise what went wrong and not just be stamping the feet saying, well, why wasn't it good? Why wasn't it good? I'm going to talk through um, an example for you, which is a case study from, from my school. Um, this was a good to outstanding procedure trainee of this academic year. I'm using him as a real example because we've taken him on as an NQT for September. Um, subject is maths. I've put subject knowledge outstanding because that's very important. Uh, PhD in astrophysics, okay? He had worked for four years uh, in CERN, you know what I mean, that big particle. He'd started his teacher training, uh, not this academic year, the year before. 
and by Christmas he'd left the course with a view, it was partly the school he was in, uh, he had a view that it wasn't really for him at that point, but instead of just leaving, he then went and worked with a group of refugees in Norwich for six months. And I didn't realise that until I was actually interviewing him for the Post. But in hindsight, that shows how dedicated he was to actually becoming a teacher. The refugees were teenage, teenagers. Um, and when he came to us, I realised how good he was at the maths and all of that. But he was very, very static. Right, so I've put progress of groups, uh, making progress for all groups of students, I've put that as good. Put him in front of top set maths, he was phenomenal. All right, his mathematical delivery, and they were eating, like, right, quick, I need to know more. But put him in front of 7C, which is our bottom set year seven, he was like a rabbit in headlights. And the first time I observed him, I said, look, you're going to have to engage with them, and you're going to have to smile. Well, he started to just smile. He'd write something on the board, then turn around and go, <laughs> and then go back to the board and then do a thumbs up at a child who's putting his hand up to ask to go to the toilet you know and I thought oh my god what am I going to do because I knew he had potential by the time it came to review four I was ready to initiate good to outstanding procedures with him but what did I do to get him there a maths teacher who's so static and just goes that's a difficult challenge I'm just going to put a few prompts on the board and I'd like you to th I'd like you to think how those things could come into play. MFL, how does that link to maths? Drama, how does that link to maths? Peer review, engagement and realisation. Just have a little think. Brings in creativity. creativity. Yes, creativity. But he didn't suddenly start teaching French. Um, any ideas? That's exactly what I did. I sent him into the French lesson, but our head of MFL is outstanding. She's never had less than outstanding from Ofsted, and she's taught there for 25, 30 years. She's brilliant, and she gets these really hard, tough kids up out the seat doing choral repetition of anything. So the next time I went to observe him, he had these kids up out of their seat, going around the classroom, doing their three times table. It was fantastic. The kids were grinning from ear to ear. One times three is three. Two times three is six. It was brilliant to see. They'd never had maths like that. And I know that's very basic, but our year seven bottom set is really basic. Drama. Yeah. I think all good teachers are actors, actually. Yeah, yeah we are, yeah. So it's delivery. Yeah, and it is. Together. Yeah, in delivery and enthusiasm. So I sent him to observe a drama teacher. There's a theme here. Observing other teachers. Use your own staff. Use what you have got in your school. So, when I the same lesson as these kids are marching around the classroom, he's teaching them about area and perimeter. And bearing in mind, this was the guy who used to stand like this. He suddenly pulls out a pretend caterpillar that he's made. And the whole class are taking it round areas of the room and the kids are measuring areas and he's pretending to be a caterpillar. I was nearly in tears, not with laughter, just like, wow, he's got it. And in the lesson feedback, I said, so how do you think that went, Mr Edwards? And he said, I think it was okay. I said, right, come on, let's have some enthusiasm. How do you think it went? He said, do you know what? When I started teaching, I thought I'm going to have to work in a sixth form where I teach further maths. And he said, this is now my favourite class and I don't think I want to teach sixth form. He went, I've had that light bulb moment. And I thought, oh, I can stop now. I can stop being a professional mentor and pass the baton on. He was really enthusiastic about it. The peer review came from a trainee we had in English who was also on Good to Outstanding. I got them to observe each other and give each other feedback because it was less, it's less intimidating sometimes to have a peer do it if there's that supportive environment. Sometimes it's, it's over the top to have the professional subject mentor in there every single time. But with your peers, if there's a good environment, it can be very constructive. And they might see things that we miss because we take a lot for granted because we've been doing it a long time. Engagement, that was both him and the students. And when I say from him, he was obviously engaged with the course, but it was taking it to another level. I said to him, I suggest you go and see French. The reason he's outstanding is he didn't just go and see French, he booked himself in for a week and even went to French Revision Club. He was enthusiastic about his own development and realisation, he realised what he had to do and he, took the, he went the extra mile in order to do so. Has anybody got any stories like that that they'd want to share? Because I'm in a room full of experts, I'm sure we all do this. Okay, I have had examples where it hasn't worked. And when it hasn't worked, 
it's because someone is fixated on becoming outstanding when really they're almost not there. And that's when I have put things in place at Review 4 and said, no, I'm not initiating good to outstanding procedures because I'm sorry, there's just not enough there. And sometimes I do find it a bit awkward that we have to grade trainees as such. And I know I've been in cluster meetings where we've discussed this at length because I think a lot of the time you can get an outstanding at your trainee year and then they get to their NQT year and by Christmas they are in absolute bits because they've got a full timetable, duties, parents' evenings, left, right and centre. Nobody holds your hand as much and they can be shell-shocked and in floods of tears. And quite often in our school we employ trainees we've had and ones from outside and by Christmas I know the ones we've had ourselves will be a bit down here because they think, well, it was so easy last year, I did so well. And that's about the realisation that by the end of the year, it'll be back to where it was, but teaching's a blooming hard slog, isn't it? Um, so, Karen said, even though I started late, I can finish a bit early so you can all go and get a brew. Um, my, my tips are, make the targets incredibly manageable for them. Um, audit their practice. The question audit is really, really useful. I have got a question audit um, pro forma that I use at my school. Uh, I can give people my email address if you want me to share materials. I'm always really happy to do that. Uh, use your staff. We are the most cost effective form of uh, training in a school because we've got people who are brilliant at their jobs. Share it. It's also a bit of pride, I think, for some staff. You say, can, can my trainee come and observe you? They really get a buzz from it. And then, of course, if the trainee forgets, then they're going to kill you because they've spent <laughs> ages planning the lesson. Um, and peer support, use the trainees together. I will say, sometimes it's quite awkward when you have two trainees in the same subject, one of whom is a clear high flyer and one of whom needs a lot of support. It can be quite awkward and requires careful managing from yourselves. We've had it a little bit awkward this year with trainees from MMU and then one from Manchester, and they just it wasn't working between them and that's difficult sort of keeping them apart in the staff room but it's what we do um, has anybody has anybody got any questions or comments that they would like to ask or could you tell us your email address yes i certainly can is there has anybody got um a board pen yeah there you go so i'll just do it like this do not want there you go. That should be a little M. Um, 